Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation is the gospel, which I read earlier. We'll read through it in just a second as we go through the sermon. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, let our minds not wander as we hear your word today, but let, them be, let, let us pay attention really well to what you have. And Lord, especially let our hearts not wander. But as you promise that your word will achieve what you sent, what you sent it for, O oh Lord, strengthen our faith because of it. And now set a guard over my mouth that I speak the truth and only the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, my dear family in Christ. It's been a few years since I made this particular hospital call I have in mind. It was a very early morning. It was in Baltimore. And there, one of our members was going to have surgery. And it was like a 5 a.m. surgery. So I was there at O Dark 30. In fact, the pre, uh, pre-surgery unit, it was just still, except for one young man who's running one of those floor polishers back and forth, and wasn't real loud. I don't think he was keeping too many people awake, but I saw him at about 3.30 that morning, whatever it was, and I said to him, good morning, how are you? His answer sort of uh, startled me in a way. He said, blessed. I thought, what a wonderful answer that was. What a great way to say what was on his mind and heart. But I tell you, I didn't ask him what he meant by that because like we were talking a moment ago, blessed can mean some different things, all good, but it can mean some different things. And maybe I should ask him, what do you mean by that? Did he mean that because his heart was set on Jesus that it didn't matter what his circumstances were, he was at rest? Did he mean that, you know, this is wonderful to have a job? Or that things were going really well in his life and he was just thankful for all of it. Maybe I should have asked. I told that story because like I told the children a moment ago, our Lord in the opening seconds of what many people have rightly termed the best sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, uses the word blessed nine times. Must want us to hear it, huh? What did Jesus mean by that word blessed? The Greek word's interesting. The Greek word has at its root to be happy, but to be happy because you don't have the normal cares and concerns that other people have because you're so rich that you know that you can pretty much meet what's there. Now, of course, we can hear some spiritual things there, right? And we'll get there in a little while. The Latin term is the term that you're going to be most familiar with. The Latin term is beatus. Maybe you don't know that one. But it's the word from which we get our word, beatitude. Maybe you've heard the first 12 verses of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 called the Beatitudes. Well, that means the blesseds. And that's what we're looking at today on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany as our Lord reveals to us what that word blessed means in His kingdom. Well, let's look at verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, He went up onto a mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. I only want to pause here for a second to just note, who's the audience here? This was not an outreach moment per se. This was not meant for people who didn't already know that Jesus was at least a prophet and probably the Messiah. This was meant for people that he already calls his students. That's that word disciple. People that already recognized, is he the Messiah? And we're already having some great epiphanies like, well, he must be. Who preaches with such authority? Who can do the miracles that he does? And unlike our rabbis, he preaches the word of God. Now, I'm sure there were some new students in that group that had begun to see these things in Jesus. Maybe they already said he has to be the Messiah, but there was a lot of confusion about what that meant. There, were un- there was also likely some students who'd already grown. I think about Nathaniel. Remember when Nathanael first heard that Jesus was the Messiah? He said, how can anything good come from Nazareth? He's comparing what he knows about the Christ promised in the Old Testament to what he hears and sees in Jesus. And he's growing like many others. New student or old, it was time for class. And Jesus rang the bell, so to speak. He went up on a mountain where he could gather them around, gets them close, and he wants to teach them how God sees things and how they will begin to see them as they follow Jesus. And to hear that word blessed and know what God means by it. So let's go into the Beatitudes, verses 2 to 12. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. He said these things. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, <clears throat> because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In fact, that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Were you a bit uneasy as I read through those Beatitudes? I'll admit, as I began the study of these things, I read through them and thought, Bleh, heard this a hundred times. And it hadn't sunk in. But when I went back and I read them again, I began to get some uneasy feelings in my stomach. Because it says here, blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, what does it mean? Well, isn't that a sort of a synonym for humble? Well, yeah, it is. And as a follower of, of Christ, a student of Jesus, I know that I cannot stand before God and claim heaven based on what a good boy I am. Because I'm not. Not most of the time. <laughs> not any time. But doesn't this say that if I want the blessing of the kingdom of heaven, I need to be really humble, poor in spirit. That doesn't sound so good. Or what about blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted? You know about some of the religious American movements in the early part of our country's history. One of such, and several others have followed in more modern times, that said that a real Christian needs to mourn. And maybe all the time because we're sinners all the time. And if we're going around happy, jolly, and all that time, we're not realizing what sinners we are. We need to be serious and maybe even just somber most of the time, or else we'll lose the blessing of God's comfort. Blessed are the gentle, the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Not what my football coach has taught me. As a matter of fact, isn't that the American adage, nice guys finish last? One of the most famous coaches in the NFL said it, and I believed it. But even if we understand this as Jesus meant it, that as we deal with each other, we give up to the right to, to vengeance, any kind of revenge. That we don't deal with each other in one-upsmanship. We don't deal with each other in intimidation. As a matter of fact, as God's Word teaches us, we consider the needs and wants of our brothers and sisters even more than our own and try our best to make sure those things happen. Even if that describes you, even if we see it that way, does it describe you? Even most of the time. Ask anyone I went to high school with, anyone on whose team I played, meek, they'd have laughed in your face. Not him, not him. So how does this blessed apply to me? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Hunger and thirst to have things God's way. Ever had a time when, yeah, you know it, but you really sort of don't want that right at the moment. Because what you're doing, your conscience says that's wrong, but you can beat that voice down for a little while because I really want to do this. Oh, this one bothers me. You know, I am, I am often so ashamed of what I thought or said or done. And when I realize that, when that shame is there, that's a good thing because that drives me back to my Savior and I want what God wants and I want His ways when that moment happens right then. But is it a gnawing hunger and just an insatiable thirst? How hungry or thirsty for righteousness do I need to be before I get the blessing? If I'm looking at the Beatitudes this way, I'm starting to really dislike them. Blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. Ever hear of a thing called compassion fatigue? Those of you who've been involved with people who have special needs, you know it. You know, you need to provide that care, and sometimes you just run out of emotional energy to do it. It is a truth about that. It's one of the reasons that caretakers also need a break. It's just true about us. But aren't there other times, too, where you have been kind to a person over and over, and they haven't deserved it, and really they don't need it for life and limb, and figuratively they keep on biting the hand that feeds them? Just how merciful do I have to be to get this blessing? <clears throat> okay, here's the one. 
Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. God's word just went for the jugular. Me, pure in heart? Yeah, <laughs> never. I'm ashamed to admit what the truth is because the truth is a horrible, horrible thing. According to this, there's no way I can expect to see God except in judgment. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. Now I will admit, I've done some peacemaking in my day as a pastor and even before. I've, I've been the go-between, between friends, and as a pastor, sometimes between members, sometimes uh, between husband and wife and child and parent. I've done some of that. But there's been some times where I just plain didn't show up, and I knew that maybe I should have been there. Or worse, I've gone to war with my thoughts and my words. You know, I thought about this as I was writing this and said, if I lived 150 years ago, the only peacemaker I might know is the one strapped to my hip. And then Jesus pronounces people blessed who are persecuted because they're living a godly life. And if you choose to live a godly life, people are going to notice that. Not like it. Because this world says conform to us. And if you're different, you're weird and you don't fit in and something's wrong with you. And Jesus said, blessed are you, blessed are you when people insult you. Tell lies about you because of him, because such things put us in such good company with the prophets of old. But that brought me back to a question my pastor asked us many years ago. I don't know the context anymore. I just remember the question. He said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Ouch. Now, before an elder rightly throws me out of the pulpit, <laughs> my prayer is that you understand what I've been doing here for the last few minutes is to look at the Beatitudes this way because God, we all need God's Word to root out of us this idea that we can earn something from God, that we're good enough to stand on our own, that we can move God to do these things, that, that somehow in some way I must have done something to get God to like me or to give me that brand new pair of shoes or to give me His blessings even of heaven or to put it another way in, an, in a way on which I have unfortunately heard it preached that we need to live the way we he, he, see here in the Beatitudes to move the hand of God to bless us. Blasphemy. So how would our Lord have us understand his word? Well, begin by recalling what Jesus himself said in John 5, 39. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So let's go look for Jesus in the Beatitudes. Jesus completely humbled himself. We talk about that poor in spirit. In Philippians 2, it says, Though he was by very nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to put on display. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. He had no sin to move him to be poor in spirit before God. But remember, he became sin for us. That's amazing. The answer to each one of these beatitudes that Jesus can say is, deserved it, did it, Qualified for it, 100%. He mourned over Jerusalem for all the right reasons, didn't he? He didn't mourn because, oh, they won't let me set up my kingdom, stamp, stamp, stamp my feet. What he did instead was he said, I, like a mother hen wants to gather her chicks around her and, and doesn't want any of them to be lost, so I have reached out to you. And what'd you do? You rejected the Savior God sent you, and he knows what that's going to cost them. And he mourns over that. And yet he finds such relief and such comfort in the promise that his father says, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. And his father is abiding with him all the time. He rejoiced that he had lost none of those that God had given to him. And although we see Jesus in righteous anger, driving the money changers from the temple, we also see him in such gentleness, such meekness. How about with the woman of Samaria at the, at the well? He knew the lifestyle she had lived, all the things she'd been caught up in, and he came to save her anyway. That's mercy. That's gentleness on display. No one ever hungered and thirsted for righteousness like Jesus. Yeah, he's perfect. He's holy. He, had, he was totally pure in heart. But the scriptures say he was tempted in every way, just as we are. How great for us that Jesus did not sin. Our salvation hung in the balance, and Jesus did it right. And Jesus was the peacemaker of peacemakers. Wait a minute on that one. Peacemaker? 
Didn't Jesus himself say, I did not come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Two will be against three and three against two. It's true. It's true. And some of you know that firsthand. You know that with Jesus, there is no middle ground. And if they reject Jesus, they will eventually also reject those who follow him. But Jesus made a peace that no mere man could ever make. And that's peace between God and people. From the book of Colossians, we learn that Jesus, true man and also true God, is the one the Father sent to reconcile the world to himself, here's the words, by making peace through the blood of his cross. When Jesus shed his blood for you, when he said it is finished, you were at peace with God. And the empty tomb on Easter morning, God says, that's exactly what I mean. Now there is peace between you and God. That means when God looks at you, he sees you as holy. Really? Yes. Blameless, faultless before Almighty God and worthy to be called his sons and daughters and live in his kingdom. And persecuted for doing what's right? Who is that more than Jesus? The Sanhedrin, you know how hard they tried to find even two false witnesses who would at least agree so they could get some kind of a guilty verdict against Jesus? Couldn't do it. The evidence wouldn't hold up. There was no evidence. You might remember that at one time when people wanted to kill Jesus, Jesus turned and looked at them and said, Who among you can convict me of any sin? He was guiltless. But that did not stop the Jewish ruling authorities from treating him even worse than they had treated God's Old Testament prophets. Jesus is the only one who deserves every blessing that we've read in the Sermon on the Mount. But it's not the end of the story, is it? God's word in Galatians chapter 3 teaches us this. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Indeed, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. By grace, through faith in Jesus. And at your baptism, at which God washed away your sins and claimed you as his child, God clothed you with his son. Who does he see when he looks at you? He sees Jesus. He sees what Jesus did for you. That's why he can say holy and perfect. God sees you the way he sees his son. Holy, sinless, deserving of his kingdom and all his blessings, all because of Jesus and in Christ alone. So because Jesus always lived, said, did, thought everything exactly as God had commanded, all who believe in him receive the blessings that we have here. Because God says, that's what I have out here are people clothed in Christ. Now we're not quite done with what our Lord has for us in this text. In Romans 6, God's word teaches us, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him by this baptism into his death, so that just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too would also walk in a new life. We know that our old self was crucified with him. And now, as the scriptures say, he has made us new in the attitude of our minds. And he has created for us a new self who loves what God loves and does what God wants. Anytime we do as God has commanded us, out of love for what he has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ, we have brought forth what Jesus called good fruit, worked in us by the Holy Spirit as he works through the gospel to will and to do according to God's good purpose. So that new person that God has created in you, when he brought you to faith, is poor in spirit and loves to sing, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That new person has all those attributes that Jesus mentions in the Beatitudes. And that new life that God has created sees one more sweet thing in the Beatitudes. When Jesus uses the word blessed, He's talking about something we don't do for ourselves. When we confer a blessing on someone, it's because they don't already have that, like that pair of shoes that I didn't have before they were given to me. And so all these things we have in the Beatitudes, we're not told about, you need to do this to get this. We're told, I've given you this, and look at the result in your life with the new man God has created. I'm going to read it differently for you in just a moment. They all depend on Jesus. They don't come from us. We are not the cause of those blessings. Jesus is. Remember the song? Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Can my heart felt longing still? 
So we are poor in spirit because Jesus has made us citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed when we mourn because when we mourn over our sins, what does our Savior say? Right then, no waiting period, I forgive you. When we mourn over the loss of a loved one or just a loss in our lives, we know that God has promised us such blessings in heaven and that for those we've lost who are part of the kingdom, we shall meet again. We can afford to be gentle because we're heirs of the kingdom of God. Some of those blessings we see now, but we'll see so much more in the new heaven and the new earth. We know that God has been merciful to us. How sweet then to share that with someone else who needs mercy. And you will see God and you'll see his smile because in Jesus, God says you are pure in heart. You are God's sons and true peacemakers as you share the word of peace. You're doing it in this worship service, just by being here and encouraging your fellow members to be here and share those things. You do it as you sing together the words of peace that we have in gospel hymns that we have before us. You're doing that when you talk about Jesus at home or at work or wherever you are, because that is the peace that passes all understanding and gives people heaven. And when people insult you, maybe even threaten your life for believing that Jesus is Lord and Savior, who bought you at the price of his own blood, rejoice and be glad. You're in mighty good company. They're treating you like Jesus because that's how God sees you. The world sees you that way too, interestingly enough. And they will persecute you like they did him. So here are the Beatitudes this way. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See how that reads differently than the first time we did it? Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. We have that promise. Blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth. We know that. We can afford to be. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. I love coming here to church and hearing my sins are forgiven, even if I'm the one talking, because it's Christ who's talking. When Pastor Crewall does it, it feels better, I suppose. But <laughs> because, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a word. Blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. We understand those things. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. That's why I want to be pure in heart. That's what changes me. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't depend on you. So let me ask you, good morning, how are you doing? <laughs> Blessed? Oh, you bet. Amen. Please rise.